everyone, welcome back to Fighting Spirit Film Festival 2022. Happy New Year. Today, we have a special guest. Please introduce yourself. My name is Greg Burridge. What were your first memories of wrestling? What was it that drew you to wrestling? My first memories of wrestling, my dad took me to um, SummerSlam 92, which was at Wembley Stadium, the old Wembley Stadium. And it was quite a big, a big event because um, back then wrestling only really, well, WWE, WWF as it was known, only had four pay-per-views a year compared to the two a week or whatever they're doing now. And it was a really big privilege for Britain to get SummerSlam. You know, you had Royal Rumble, then you had WrestleMania, so you had Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series. We got one of the big four. And it was at Wembley Stadium. And um, very fortunate to go. My dad took me. We thought we bought really good tickets to go by the ring. But that day, they mucked up the tickets. And all the people that bought the expensive tickets were sent to the back. And all the, all the cheap tickets were to the, uh, to the front. But, um, so I remember being way back up in the, up in the rafters. But it didn't matter because it was such an experience, such energy of all the British and European fans. Especially remember Brett the Hitman Hart versus British Bulldog and half the crowd shouting Bulldog and the other, sh uh, other shouting Hitman, Bulldog, Hitman. Are you in a stadium that's famous for, you know, football, football matches? Can you tell us how you got your start with wrestling? What was your training like? Well, I went, I went out to America to do it in 2001. And then didn't really work. I didn't research very well, <laughs> I guess. I came back and I, I studied at um, the FWA in Manor House at the time. But I really kind of learnt my trade when I started going to a wrestling school called Drop Kicks in a judo hall in uh, Perfleet, which was only around the corner from where I was living at the time. I would have travelled around the world. And I did travel around the world to be a pro wrestler. I would have travelled to Scotland to be, you know, weekly, daily to be a pro wrestler. To have a wrestling school open 30 minutes from me was just, I don't think people take for granted how lucky they are now in this day and age with wrestling school in every corner. Um, there was no wrestling schools in the UK at all, really. It was probably, saying that, it was probably about two schools. But to have one open up, you know, around the corner from me, it was just, I was honoured. So I made the most of it and I, I started training down there. When I started, there was only two people. There was me and some other girl. Well, actually, there was three and a judo guy. And then drop kicks kind of grew into the, like, you know, two of oh, about 100 people, I guess. Some of the best wrestlers came from that place. You had Stu Sanders that went on to go into uh, NXT, who's known as Stu Bennett now. Nick Aldis. You had Mighty Scroll. You had Terry Dormer, Terry Fraser, Shah Samuels, Tom Chamberlain. Loads of guys now that are making their, their money around the world started at that version of drop kicks. I, I started there and I took away the safety net and I said, you have to do this? Otherwise, you know, you, you've got nothing else to do in your life. So I did. I just gave it my all, put myself out there and uh, shy kids get no sweets. And what that means is you have to go up and ask if you want something. And I did. I went around to all the promoter, uh, promoters in Britain. I told them who I was. I told them who I trained with. And that opened some doors. That got me tryouts, you know, and that got my foot in the door of pro wrestling. That's a really good quote that people should live by. I love it. My, my, my friend, actually, he, he started it. He was, a, he was a Marine. His name was Mike Schofield. And I met him in a club. And he was wearing Crayola pants latex Crayola pants nothing else half his body was tattooed and he was six foot seven and I said up to him and I said I'm going to make you a wrestler I didn't know his name and lo and behold not only did I make him a pro wrestler I got him signed to the WWE he was destined for big things um, but he had a heart condition you know and they do full medicals when you go to the WWE he's been in the, you know he's been in the army he's been in the marines and they, they, you know, now they've just discovered he's got this heart condition he had to go and have operations and such. But his saying was, you know, shy kids get no sweets. And he definitely weren't shy and he ate a lot of sweets. <laughs> but um, he's actually in my first movie, London Rampage. He's the guy who has a kickboxing fight, Will Ospreay. Um, and he's done a couple other things. With, he's done a film with Jude Poyer, some stunts on that a little while back. But um, unfortunately, he died. He died <laughs> due to his, his heart and stuff. But um, 
that's why you know it's one of my my, my favourite sayings, and I always will live by it because uh, he's a good lad, Mike. So shy kids get no sweets. Remember that, guys. Can you tell us a bit about the first wrestling match you ever did? The first wrestling match I ever did was a Royal Rumble, which no, sorry, a Battle Royal. And Battle Royal is basically very unlike the film. Actually, it's quite like the film, I guess. <laughs> Except that it was in Croydon, not in Japan. You basically get in a ring, 20 of you, and you just beat the crap out of each other until there's one left. So you throw them out the ring, throw them over the top, etc. And that was my first match. And that match had a lot of big names in it. When I look back, it had Nigel McGuinness. It had one of the Highlander brothers in there from uh, the tag team. It had Daniel Bryan, or Bryan Danielson, as... It was known back in the day, Robbie Brookside. It had quite a lot of guys in it, and little old me got beaten in that thing. <laughs> so, yeah, that was my first introduction, but I was really scared, and like, my stepdad was taking me down to the down to the show, I remember, and he kind of like, calmed my nerves by talking about space. <laughs> it was weird. I don't know if he did it on purpose or he saw it. I was nervous, but I was in my pants. I was so scared. And I remember the countdown coming from backstage. It was going 10, 9 eight and I was just about to walk out you know I was still scared and then the minute it went one and the curtains went back I was no longer Greg Burridge I'd become my character and all my fears went away and all my uh, anxiety went away and just got there and I did it I had a great time. Can you tell us about grab food the technique you developed? Yeah kind of like a, a hybrid version of pro wrestling techniques mixed with um, stunt fighting screen fighting the high flying, I mean, you usually see people like Black Widow do them a lot, the Harakaranas, where they wrap their legs around the head. It kind of mixes gymnastics with Mexican Lucha Libre wrestling. But the part where I, I differ from, from anyone else trying to teach this technique, I guess, is I, I was trained by old world of sport pro wrestlers that were around in the 60s. And the, well, yeah, I'd say they even got trained in the, in the 50s and 60s. And they learnt a style of pro wrestling that is not really seen a lot today. And a lot of people call it world of sports style, which is the traditional British wrestling. There's a lot of locks, submission locks and, and holds and these kind of things. I love that. And I could see the technique, how it is very similar to, at the time, this is 2004, um, you remember a film called Tom Young Gun with Tony Jaa. And Tony Jaa was like my... I, I, my idol I loved him and his, his films were my bible and I was actually living out in Thailand at the time and I started watching his stuff there's a fight where Tony is just putting locks on people's ankles and lock and legs and all these kind of different um, leg manipulation bars and arm bars with really naughty sound effects of bones crunching and in the end he's standing and there's like 20 big guys just all around him on the floor I remember watching those locks I'm thinking those locks are very similar to the locks that I got taught in pro wrestling. Very inspired by what Tony did with Thailand and putting Thailand on the map by taking their martial art and putting it into the, into the world's eye by showing them this is what Muay Thai is, this is what Thai action is. In a very, without trying to sound arrogant, I wanted to do the same, but for British wrestling and British action movies. I thought, we've, we have a very unique way of fighting. This will be my niche way. We like to eye gouge and grit and grab and put these different submission locks on. And all the different kind of same elements I was taught in pro wrestling with the old traditional world sports style. So what I wanted to do was showcase that in my films, these these pressure points and locks and British holds that are just totally lost to time now but with action, with gun disarmaments, with, you know, flying this and that. But also, let's throw in the high-flying elements of Mexican Lucha Libre. So it's a little mixture of everything. And then with that comes the, the screen fighting techniques of understanding the law of boxing, the rules of boxing, the technique of, of screen fighting, the, the foot positioning. So there's all these different things that you kind of take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and you kind of make this melting pot of unique, yeah, I hope unique, kind of fighting technique, which is what, what I call Bratfu. You founded the London School of Lucha Libre. Can you tell us about the origins of the school? Myself and Gary Van Horn started it back in 2009. Um, we was already running Lucha Britannia shows. And if you don't know what Lucha Britannia is, it's this crazy Mexican um, wrestling show with burlesque acts that kind of happened in 
like a secret underground uh, arteries around London. <laughs> it's the best way to explain it. And it's not really a wrestling show. It's a cabaret show with wrestling involved within it. And it was the best night at London. You know, Time Out even would, would, would monthly say how, how good our show was. And, you know, we had press everywhere. And we decided, you know, we need to start a wrestling school up to show people, you know, not only to be pro wrestlers, but show them they could be a performer, they could be a stunt fighter, and they could be a Mexican wrestler. And they could even be part of the Lucha Britannia show, which happened with a lot of the guys that came through our doors. They ended up being guys on our shows. And we took them on tour. We set the school up and we just started teaching people Mexican wrestling. And I learned Mexican wrestling from the Mexicans that would come over and train with us to do, they would teach seminars. And being a big fan of the British pro wrestling technique and learning the Mexican technique, I kind of adapted the two together, you know. So I, I always believe you shouldn't just learn one thing from one person. Take something from everyone and then you create your own style, which is kind of hard in any other martial art because you're kind of devoted to that school. You must stay with your, with your sensei and do that. Pro wrestling is kind of a little bit different. You can kind of travel around and take a little bit of what you want from this school and then go to another school and go to another school. And then you kind of, you find your own style and your own technique. That was the, that's kind of like where the school came from. We, 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 we had to shut our doors in 2020, what, 20, COVID, but also, you know, we kind of got priced out the market a little bit, I guess, with the place. But um, yeah, maybe one day, well, we'll see what happens with uh, open up schools in the future. But with the COVID as it is in the UK, and I guess this is the same with a lot of martial art schools in, in Britain, in the world, to be fair. It's very hard to predict trying to run a, a school. You're a fight choreographer as well as a wrestler. How do you prepare for a project as a fight choreographer? You have to approach each project with understanding what, well, one, you need to understand what the story is about. First off, the vibe of the film as well. Is, is it an action? Is it a suspense? Is it because all these different elements come into the different style of choreography you want to put in the film or you want to get across? So that's very important to me, first of all. You've got to understand the story and what the, the film or the director is trying to get across with his film and also with the choreography. Uh, you know, you can't go and make rush hour in, you know, a, rom a romance film, can you really? So you have to understand the style. It's kind of like there's so many different things you have to look out for. The actors as well, are they trained in any form of martial arts for start? Because then it can really hinder or it can really benefit the project. Because the more experience they got, the more you can do. The more you can suggest to the director, you know, this guy has experience in this. So let's base these fights around this, this martial art that they, they're very comfortable with. Because sometimes it is really hard to teach people a style of fighting if they're used to one way or another. So, yeah, it all comes down to the actors, how keen they are, how proficient they are doing stunts, um, the story, the script, the, the beats, the flow of the film, because all these different elements come into, into getting that, that, that message across in the end. So, yeah, there's lots of different elements, really, you need to kind of look into before you start uh, credibly structuring a fight as well. Because, again, it's got to be credible to the story, credible to the actors, credible to the flow, the all these different things. But yeah, um, but the first thing is getting used to the script, understanding the script and the vision as well of what the director wants. Because usually the directors are very vocal and they've already made the film in their heads before they come and see you, before even anything starts rolling. In their, in their mind's eye, the film has been created. So it's about being as true to the director's creativity and vision as you can be, but also suggesting other things that might make the project better that they might not have considered before.